India is a vast land, intense and full of extremes. Spectacular landscapes lie next to overflowing multitudes of humanity. Wretchedness and decay blend with astonishing wealth. Side by side, one finds overwhelming noise and deep serenity, cruelty and kindness, dark ignorance and the highest wisdom. India is a land of paradox. Where else can one witness the sight of a prisoner weeping like a child in the arms of his jailer? But this is not just another Indian paradox. This is an entirely different story. I came to Tihar in 1988. I get caught in the airport, Indira Gandhi International Airport, <coughs> sorry, uh, with four kilo of heroin. Um, put here on NDPS charge for um, allegedly possession of some charts. ट्रिपल मर्डर केस अहमदाबाद में हुआ था उन्नीस सौ तिरासी में उस केस में मुझे पहले फांसी की सजा हुई थी उसके बाद में यानी हाई कोर्ट में लाइफ सेंटेंस की सजा हुई वन माई डूइंग इन इंडियन जेल टाइम इज वट आई एम डूइंग इन इंडियन जेल नो एक्चुअली आई एम डूंग We are all prisoners, undergoing a life sentence, imprisoned by our own minds. We are all seeking parole, being hostages of our anger, fear, desire. Is there anyone who doesn't crave at one point or another to take something that is not his? Is there anyone who doesn't wish, at least once, to hurt the one who hurts him? It is a thin line that separates us from these people who stare at us from inside this cage. The same things that do not go beyond the threshold of our thoughts have crossed, in their case, the threshold of action. But still, we are alike. Inside our heads, we are all potential criminals. This is Tihar Jail, one of the largest prisons in the world. 10,000 people are imprisoned here. 9,000 of them are still awaiting their trials. The wheel of justice rolls slowly and heavily in India, like an overloaded truck. A pickpocket may find himself waiting for six years in order to receive a one-year sentence. It could take um, another two weeks, it could take um, yeah, another two years, three years, four years. They take their time. Located in suburban New Delhi, Tihar is India's best known high security prison. Due to its large population, it is divided into four separate jails. For decades, Tihar was notorious for its inhuman conditions. It was branded a veritable hell.
Violence, corruption and drug use are common problems in almost any prison. But in Tihar, they were magnified due to congestion and harsh conditions. It was a horrible place. There was a lot of extortion, a lot of a beating, a lot of a gang fights within the side, inside the jails. There was a lot of a problems, many problems. The combination of 1,000 convicts, along with thousands still awaiting their trials, had created a hierarchy of power and an explosive atmosphere. There are massive more under trials than there are convicts. But the few can't control the many. Take from the under trials. Convicts used extortion. You, you beat a, a few people up occasionally, and um, the many will come across with a few rupees here, a few rupees there, you know? The inmates, they're not being themselves. I mean, this a macho image, I mean, tough, aggressive. You know, you get a few thousand macho people together, you know, and, and that's a lot of aggression. You know? And that's a lot of controlling, because this is prison. That's a lot of controlling to do. So I've understood when I first came here myself that uh, sometimes a stick had to be used. But um, you have a point where you don't go beyond. The jail staff were trained under the old tradition of oppression isolation and punishment. They believed that if the prisoners were made to suffer, they would not commit crimes after their release for fear of being sent back to this hell. But they were wrong. In Tihar, prisoners were specializing further in crime. I'm here now about 13 months. I was taking some heroin from Kathmandu to Toronto via the airport in New Delhi. I was searched in New Delhi and I was brought here. David is one of the foreign inmates kept in Tihar. Everybody is a, a legal expert in, in Tihar jail. Everybody knows all the ins and outs of the Indian system. It just so happens some of them will be here for six or seven years maybe, but they'll tell you how to get out. Hmm. With this record, Tihar was hardly the place to expect a breakthrough in prison reform. And yet, this is exactly what happened. In May 1993, a new Inspector General of Prisons was posted. The new IG was Kiran Bedi, a little woman with a big reputation and an even bigger vision. As India's first woman police officer, Bedi has always attracted controversy, using unconventional methods to achieve high goals. To me, she's a magnificent woman. She's, she's got uh, integrity, she's got very high morals, and she certainly has ambition. She's been everything from a tennis star to a notorious um, policewoman who used to tow away dignitaries' cars from tow-away areas. That's where they called her Crane Bedi. I clearly, vividly remember the day when she, she was to join. We have a meeting for one, uh, one and a half hours. And that meeting, she only made us clear, there is a very thin thread between us as officers and those inside. We have also made blunders in our life. But thank God we are not inside. Unfortunately, they are. Right from the start, Betty told her staff that she intended to turn Tihar prison into a place for personal development, an ashram. I started to share with them my vision of a prison. I held my meetings, first of all told them that you're going to work as a team, work as a family. Asking them, are they aware of what their whole job priority is? What are they meant for? Are they here as watchmen or are they here for a larger job? Ever since she took office, she did a lot of a transformation. She's a person who, who solves problems. If you cannot solve a problem, that you are part of the problem yourself. We kept using a lot of love and care, actually giving them love and care. I allowed them books, canteen facilities, better medical care, clothing, radio, outside visitors. Before we were regarded here as, um, I don't know really what to, it's beyond description of the words. She showed us that we are human beings. And therefore, we deserve to be treated as human beings. I've talked to them, I've shared with them, I've read with them, I've laughed with them, I've sung with them, I've even danced with them. 
is to make them feel as normal as they should be feeling. Why? Because after all, when they're going out, they have to go into normal society. So how can I keep them bottled up here and expect them to be normal when they're going out? I must release them as normal human beings on, if possible, even better human beings. This is a general feeling that those who have done some crime, they should be punished. This is fine, they should be punished. But after punishment, what? They will not live in jail all through their life. They will come out in the society and if they are not reformed, they will commit more crimes. The atmosphere in Tihar had improved, but Betty knew that all material solutions are always partial solutions. She was seeking a deeper change. Human mind needs its own food. Human mind needs positivity. Human mind needs some higher thinking. So this was all I knew, because that's what my mind needs. Many of them did not know the way to change. They are ready to change. They said, okay, we want to change, but how? They have no skills to handle their problems. How do I give them skills to handle themselves? What do I do? I was absolutely like a fish out of water. Where do I go for her magic? Who will come to this prison to counsel? Who will provide the psychological food? I was just looking for an answer. And I got an answer. The answer came, unexpectedly, from inside the prison. One morning, Betty was doing her daily rounds. A young jail officer approached her and told her of an age-old teaching called Vipassana. I was walking the prison and one officer, Rajinder Kumar, came to me. said, Madam, you're looking for an answer? I have the answer. And what is the answer? There is a technique which change all. I also do a work of Vipassana meditation and it changed a lot in myself. He's, I was a very angry man. I would be horrible as a person, but I went for Vipassana and I'm a different person. Madam, if you don't believe me, ask my family, ask my colleagues. If you introduce this course in jail, though it will help all the inmates. They will get rid of their sufferings. Then she immediately told me, you give me address. So he gave me the address of Mr. Ram Singh. I wrote a letter to Mr. Ram Singh saying, could I have you visit my prison? Exactly still not knowing what Vipassana stands for. What Kiran Bedi also did not know was that this technique had previously been tried in Indian prisons. Vipassana is a journey of discovery taken with closed eyes. The goal is not simply to satisfy the traveler's curiosity, but to get transformed by the journey and start living a better life. Vipassana means insight, to see things as they really are, in their true nature. It is an ancient meditation technique discovered 25 centuries ago in India by a man named Siddhartha Gautama, known as the Buddha. The records from the Buddha's time tell remarkable stories of serial killers changed into saints and of cruel tyrants who became model rulers by practicing this technique. With the passing of time, civilizations rose and fell, but Vipassana was carefully preserved and passed on from generation to generation in South Asia. Today, it is taught by S.N. Goenka, an Indian who was born and grew up in Burma. Mr. Goenka learned Vipassana from his Burmese teacher, Sayaji Ubakin. In 1969, Mr. Goenka arrived in India and started teaching Vipassana. A few years later, he was given a challenge by the renowned Indian leader, Vinoba Bhave, to teach Vipassana to youngsters and to hardened criminals. I said, I am here to serve. If you can arrange, I will teach the, the hard criminals in the jail. I will teach the students. He arranged in the school and it was very successful. But he could not arrange in the prison because the rules of prison, manual of prison is such that uh, 
a teacher cannot go and stay there, one has to stay outside and that was not acceptable to me. When a course is given, I must be there with my students. It could not materialize. But later on, the Rajasthan government was good enough to relax their rules and first course was given there in the Jaipur jail. In 1975, in Jaipur, prisoners learned Vipassana for the first time. Mr. Goenka insisted again on some conditions and the prison authorities were trying hard to meet his demands. Before the course started, some people were brought in chains and ankle chains. So he said, what is this? I said, they are very hardened criminals and very dangerous criminals. And uh, we want that they should also get, take a course. But uh, he said, why have you put the chains on them? Because they are dangerous. He said, no, I can't give a dhamma to the people while they are in chains. So they have to be removed. And the IG and the superintendent of jail, they didn't agree. Because the IG said that there is a great possibility that one of them or few of them will get up and strangle Mr. Goenka or you as Home Secretary and they will get a big name because they are in any case dying. They will be hanged or they will have serious punishment. So we took little risk and uh, it was decided that they will put a guard close by and if anybody got up menacingly towards us, he should be shot. Fortunately, no shot had to be fired. The Jaipur jail course concluded peacefully. Its success led to more courses in other prisons. One of them was Baroda Jail. The superintendent, Mr. Vora, was impressed by the effect of Vipassana on his prisoners and decided to take a course himself. After that, he arranged five more courses in Baroda Jail. कैदियों के बीच और स्टाफ के बीच में जो कोऑर्डिनेशन है वो भी अच्छे तरह से चल रहा है कैदियों को अपने फैमिली के साथ का जो व्यवहार है वो भी अच्छे तरह से चल रहा है कैदियों में जो रिवेंज लेने की जो भावना है कि मैं यहाँ से छूट और बाद में उनको मार डालो ऐसा कर डालो ये सब उनमें से निकल गए बाबू बाया वॉज नोटोरियस फॉर किलिंग थ्री पीपल इन फाइव मिनट्स जोइंग गैंग फाइट और जो मेरी खिलाफ पार्टी थी जिनके लिए मुझे नफरत थी बदले की भावना थी इतना साधना से इतना परिवर्तन आया कि उनके लिए मुझे एक तरह की हमदर्दी जागी अपने किए पे पछतावा हुआ आफ्टर टेकिंग अ कोर्स ही कांटेक्टेड द फैमिली ऑफ हिज विक्टिम्स सीकिंग फॉरगिवनेस यानी समाधान कॉम्प्रोमाइज के लिए वे तैयार भी हुए और 92 में रक्षाबंधन के दिन यहां पे आके उन्होंने मुझे दोनों बहनों ने काफी खेल दिली पूर्वक सुख खुशी से आके उन्होंने राखी बांधी और एक भाई बहन का पवित्र नाता उन्होंने यानी जोड़ा है और आज भी मैं उनके फैमिली को पूरा अच्छी तरह अपनी फैमिली की तरह ही संभाल रहा हूं क्षमा देना और क्षमा अपना ये दोनों बहुत मुश्किल काम है जिसका हस्बैंड मार डाला है जिसका भाई मार डाला है उनके हाथ में उनके मुंह में राखी बनना उनके मुंह में कुछ स्वीट डालना हिम्मत वाली बात अ विपासन कोर्स इज टेन डेज लॉन्ग स्टूडेंट्स लिव इन कंप्लीट साइलेंस मेडिटेटिंग फ्रॉम अर्ली मॉर्निंग टिल नाइट फॉर टेन डेज दे फॉलो अ बेसिक कोड ऑफ मॉरल कंडक्ट they abstain from killing, stealing, lying, sexual activity, and the use of intoxicants. Without a base of morality, the mind will remain too agitated to investigate the reality within. Any physical or vocal action which is unwholesome, which goes against morality, which is immoral, starts with a impure mind, a negative mind. So you kill somebody, you can't kill somebody without generating tremendous amount of anger or hatred in you. You steal something, you can't steal something without generating tremendous amount of craving or greed. And every time one generates negativity in the mind, one becomes miserable. When you do something wrong, you're instantly punished. Why? Because you're now guilty. You've told a lie and you're telling hundred lies to justify one lie. You've stolen, now you're suspicious that you might be caught. The very fact that you are under the agony of getting caught is the pain you're getting out of the law of nature. Back in Tihar, Kiran Bedi was preparing the ground for a Vipassana course. Ah. She said that if a course could be organized, I say, why not? 
we can do this. So there also the similar difficulties came. I said first condition is that some of the jail senior people should attend the course first, then only will agree. Unless the keepers of the prisoners change, prisoners will not change. Kiran Bedi was not afraid to experiment with new ideas. She sent some of the more stubborn and aggressive members of her staff to a Vipassana course held outside jail. When these men returned, colleagues and inmates alike found them to be much more calm and positive. There was actually stories of a couple of officers, you know, that were caught doing the wrong thing. You know, like smuggling beaties in because they pay money for them. And, you know, women on such a small wage, this is good for them. And um, I think she was going to sack these people or, you know, get rid of them. And she like, gave them a chance and said, if you want to keep on working, like, you have to do this and this and this. And you have to go and do one of those 10 day courses as well. Everything you do, you have to pay for, one way or another. In my life is instant. I do something wrong and it's there, pow. My family still don't know um, exactly where I am. My mother thinks I'm in India, but I, don't, I didn't want to worry her to say where I was, so I thought I'd just tell her I was doing Vipassana, and I am. The first Vipassana course at Tihar Jail was held in November 1993. Over 100 prisoners and jail staff participated. She was not forcing people. Just go and see yourself. If you like it, well and good. If you don't like it, well and good. But just go please and see yourself. They were asking people interested in, in Vipassana or meditating. The school came around in one of the wards and so I went. At first, all one is asked to do is to focus on one's own natural breath, to feel it coming in and out of the nostrils, and to maintain this awareness for as long as possible. Sounds simple, but it's not. It's something which you can't avoid. You know, you can concentrate for so long, and after a while you don't realise it, but your mind wanders. And it's after a while you say, hey, you know, you're supposed to be back here, you know, concentrating, and so you come back to it. Then you find yourself, you're off wandering again, you're thinking about something which you're doing back home, and then hang on, you're supposed to be back on the meditation. When one sits down to be still, an endless stream of thoughts wells up in the mind. Memories, hopes, fears start flooding in. After a three-day struggle, the mind quiets down. Thoughts become faint, faded, like passing clouds. By focusing for so long on the small patch of skin below the nostrils, the mind becomes so sensitive that it can feel the subtlest flow of breath. A new realm of sensations unfolds within this area. Itching, tingling, heat, pressure, natural physical sensations never before experienced so vividly. Only then is one prepared to learn Vipassana. The whole idea with Vipassana is to go inside. And when you go inside and everything is quiet, and yourself you're quiet, then you contact yourself, you can come inside yourself, and you can feel your sensations. Continuous awareness of physical sensations without reacting is the core of the Vipassana practice. 
Every sound, vision, taste, smell, everything that contacts the body instantly produces some sensation. The technique focuses on natural physical sensations as the crucial link between mind and body, the key to understanding human behavior. Through Vipassana, one realizes that one's own attitudes and addictions, suffering and happiness, are not caused by the outside world. It is the reactions to pleasant or unpleasant sensations the world evokes within the body that dictate one's actions and conditions the mind. On the fourth day of the course, the Pasana is taught. Students learn how to observe objectively all the sensations in their bodies, whatever they may be, without reacting to them. They watch emotions come and go. They watch pain come and go. They watch pleasure come and go. And they realize, not intellectually, but through their own experience, that nothing is permanent. Hatred, passion, greed, are not abstract anymore. By watching the physical sensations accompanying these emotions and by understanding their impermanent nature, one can actually start changing the habit of blind reaction. Between the two poles of expression and suppression lies a third option, mere observation. After the first course, I was like, so overwhelmed with everything. I see things as the way it is, the reality. You do solve a lot of, you do get a lot of answers out of it. It's you who can make yourself into the right path, and it's you who can lead to a misery. It's a happiness in there, you know? After the course, it was no looking back. Even for us, it was saying, hey, thank God we found a remedy. We found an alternative. We found a way to take them to. Then there was no looking back. The first Vipassana course in Tihar Jail was followed by five more, and Kiran Bedi was once again thinking ahead. We became greedier. We were impatient. Why only 50, 60 when I have 10,000 people with me? So why can't we reach at least a large percentage of a massive course rather than going into small trickles to have a massive impact? They said, would you be able to arrange a course of over 1,000? I said, yes, immediately. Are you sure? I said, yes. It was one of the most ambitious projects in the history of Indian prisons. It was also the largest Vipassana course conducted in modern times. In just a few weeks, a special area was prepared inside the prison. Accommodating in one place a thousand inmates, as well as Mr. Goenka and his assistants, was a tremendous undertaking. Nobody could believe that 1,000 prisoners could be put together and kept at a place because it's a grave security risk. Vipassana Vidya, which you are experiment. What This experiment is not an experiment. It's 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 he pretends to be no saint. He is like a simple, humble teacher. He's not expecting anything in return. The way he's done it for prisoners for 10 days, he's lived in the prison for 11 days. He and his wife together. And it was no comfortable stay. One thousand prisoners gathered in the huge tent on the evening of April 4th. 
they reflected the wide range of human experience. Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, from different nations and social backgrounds. It's essential that you will keep silence, global silence. It doesn't mean that your mouth will be locked. Talk to your teachers, your guides. There is no restriction about it. In the early hours of the next day, a fierce rainstorm, extremely unusual for that dry season, suddenly descended. The tent collapsed. All the rugs and meditation cushions were completely soaked. An emergency meeting was called at 3.30 a.m. to consider cancelling the course. Instead, measures were quickly put into action, allowing it to continue. When the weather cleared, a massive salvage operation was launched. Meanwhile, the course continued as prisoners meditated in their barracks. By evening, the tent was ready again for the students to assemble, and the course went on as planned. Nine days later, it was apparent that something unique had been accomplished. It actually changed people. It made my prisoners weep. It made them cry. They had realized what life actually could be. They had looked within. And within themselves, they had seen the feeling of revenge. They had seen anger. They saw the disrespect and hurt they had caused to parents and society. And they wept. And they wanted to be different. I felt guilty that I did a wrong thing. I have done a wrong thing. And uh, what I have done, it's something which I can come out of it and correct it. That realization was the greatest magic. That's exactly what I was looking for. How do I realize them, make them realize they've actually hurt society? They're just all the time saying, we're innocent, we're innocent. We never hurt society, society hurt us. How do I convince them? that you did hurt society at some stage of your life. Therefore, law of nature has had its course, you're getting it today. So, they learned it in Vipassana, I didn't have to say anything. They went up on the mic and said, we hurt society, but we seek forgiveness. That was the greatest magic. When the course ended, 1,200 participants and international guests witnessed the inauguration of the first Vipassana center to be established in a prison. Within three weeks, it began to offer Vipassana courses twice a month. Don't expect any miracles. It will take time. Not that all of a sudden a criminal changes to the saint. The beginning of change is there. And the, again, the environment in the jail is so bad that even in one course, it doesn't change the whole environment. So unless the environment is changed, other steps are taken, facilities given for their regular practice, then real change will occur. Vipassana courses are alike everywhere in the world. The same rules, same timetable, same instructions. The workers who serve the students during a course are volunteers who have already taken a course themselves. A teacher appointed by Mr. Goenka stays within the course site for 10 days and conducts the course voluntarily. Nothing is by accident, you know. I come, I'm caught, I'm here, all for a reason. I don't have to be caught going to Canada. I could have gone to Canada and then gone back and my life, this, this, this. It's all for a reason. After taking a few Vipassana courses, David asked to be transferred to the Vipassana ward and work there as a volunteer. When I first came, I thought, why is Vipassana here? <laughs> of course, when, when I say that, it answers itself, because this is where it's needed most. This is history in the making, you know? This is the first chance where Vipassana, where this 
is being used in the prison system to possibly reform people. And if this does show results, then this could reform the whole prison system and the entire planet. And it happens here. If I scratch his belly, he should attack me. There you go. <laughs> you attack that? See, all I can really do is to try to set an example for other people. In doing this, then maybe they will try a little bit harder for themselves. David, the Just one day course is on this date, no? We have uh, the four one day courses. Yeah, your 26th morning is jail four. Yes. And 27th morning I'm bringing jail one, two and three together. So tell him we will need him at both the nine o'clock. Please tell the teacher. I cannot do anything Vipassana-wise for anybody. They have to do it themselves. The bottom line is you can't help somebody unless they want to be helped. And the Vipassana, if you can get through to them, is for themselves to get inside themselves to help. Twice a month, prisoners from different sections of Tihar arrive at the Vipassana ward to take a course. Some of them have done this a number of times. Each time they follow the same program. What differs is the personal experience. I call them bhikkhus when they come here, which is the monk, because this is in effect what they are. For ten days they become a monk. A lot of people are under the impression this ten days they come over here is, is, um, is, is so easy. It's not. You have to work. There's no sort of lazy way out of it. And actually going on the course sort of forces you to work. It's like being thrown into a, a swimming pool. You know, you have to swim then. It's not a matter of saying, yeah, I will learn to swim, I will learn to swim. It's when they throw you in the pool, that's when you have to swim. So when you go to this course, you have to do the ten days. Next to the silent bubble of the course, on the other side of the wall, prison life flows along. In Tihar jail, prisoners can have yoga lessons, counseling sessions and other educational programs. But a Vipassana course is quite different from these activities and prisoners are not always aware of this fact. We're in jail, and jail have jail rules. This is Vipassana, Vipassana has Vipassana rules. And it happens to be that Vipassana rules are more strict than what the jail is. Some of them understand, some of them don't understand. You see, in jail they, they, they have the rules, but they are, the, the game is to bend the rules as much as they can, to, or change as much as they can, to take control themselves. And they bring that same attitude in here. You still bathing, boy? And I say, no, this is not jail. That's jail. You want to go back to jail, you can go back to jail, but this is Vipassana. We do have a little bit of um, people who become jealous, maybe envious, because here people seem to get a little bit more than what other people do. They don't realize that the, the guys who come here are putting more into themselves. If somebody has had some sort of experience or self-discipline, then they seem to be falling into it much easier. Let's understand that 10 days is, is the basic, you know. I mean, this is the least amount of time necessary to get some sort of a a spark to the candle and sometimes that spark doesn't ignite maybe you need another spark another spark but after a couple the light starts to flicker it grows and then the candle is lit change does not come easy way change takes a time and as I told you earlier that this revenge which I had an anger quick temper is still subsiding. I'm not telling you exactly it went off completely one time, bam, I did a vipassana, I sit down and it just went out like that. It's still subsiding, subsiding, subsiding. Why did it happen that I'm here? What happened to me, it's what I've done to myself. And that's why I'm here.
I don't trust people as, as I used to do. Sometimes I meet them and, and they treat me not good. And I think if I have a vote, I would just pull the pin and let the whole thing explode, that's it, and start all over again. And Vipassana he keeps trying to bring me back away from this uh, distrustful people. I'm here now doing Vipassana and it's your way of life, you, you, the way you talk to people, the way you think, the way you act, the way you do things for people or don't do things for people, the art of living, they call this. of the tenth day, silence ends. On this special day, it becomes clear how long the journey it has been. Students make the transition back to a more extroverted way of life. For the first time in 10 days, they can actually talk and share experiences. It was a great opportunity for me being here. Before I used to regret, now I'm not regretting it. There is no any regret in, within me. That yes, it happened and I did this mistake. So right now I look in future ahead. Actually, I come from a very orthodox Muslim family and my parents when they used to pray and I used to always, I was a very curious child that you are praying and this person whom you are begging always, where is he? Is he upstairs? Nobody see him. And why can't he listen to prayers? Why is he prejudiced? I was looking for something which have a universal appeal, something which doesn't condemn other religions, say that this religion is bad, this ours is good. Actually, I found what I was looking for. For all these years, the thing which has been bugging me I found the answer here. Before I used to feel a lot of self-pity about being inside jail, you know, thinking why should this have happened to me, and all this sort of thing. Having the Vipassana course, it's like, I'm grateful that it was there, you know, I'm almost grateful for coming to jail to actually go there and, you know, have the opportunity to do it. You know, I often think to myself, when I get home, you know, I've got my own bedroom, I can meditate there, I can make it a, a regular part of my life. But you know, old habits die hard. And it's very easy just to fall back into the old pattern of lifestyle. So before I leave here, like I don't know when that could be, you know, there could be a chance next month or the middle or the end of next year. But actually what I'd really like to do is go to a course, complete the course, and then like the very next day to be able to walk out of jail. I'd go out in a very good frame of mind, not a bad frame of mind which this place can create. You know, this coming to tell you how it's a lesson in life I'll never forget. You know, it's, you know, why it's a great experience, but it's just gone on for too long now. You know, I'd really like it to finish and so I can go home. <laughs> Sure has come a long way. Earlier prisons were not being opened for this course. Some were, some were not. But now the government of India sent out a circular to all the prisons in India 
to encourage Vipassana courses. Because the prisons were capable of receiving it. Staff was accepting this. The community outside was expecting this to happen. You know, there was a positivity of a belief that this can happen in the prison now. People who were being released from the prison were not coming back anymore. Outside, people had started to see the change in their thinking and behavior. So there's been no looking back. which is effective here will be definitely effective anywhere in the world. Prisons in the West and the prisons in the East, men in the West, men in the East, no difference, difference of degree, but totality we are the same, same people all over the world. The traditions are different, culture is different, but man is not different. His attitude is not different. Governments are not different. It looks that government in India may be harsh and the prison conditions are very bad. It's a comparative picture. Even if you build a, all good things in the jail and all facilities, it doesn't mean that it's a good prison. What is the attitude of the people? That is very important. When a Vipassana course ends in Baroda jail, a special event takes place. In the presence of social workers and guests supporting the Vipassana program, the superintendent, a Vipassana student himself, greets the inmates coming out of the meditation hall. In this country, physical contact between people from such different backgrounds is unthinkable. But on this day, barriers are broken. Question one time I asked Ranbedi, uh, ask her about, uh, I say, Madam, uh, how many people in this world you think that they are doing? They are just here in this world. They believe they are here in this world just to do good. What's the percentage? She looked at me and there was a maybe 20, 30 people sitting there. She said, you are the percentage. It's you, people. It's you who can make it, uh, this world, a better place. 